All right, if you have a Bible, go ahead and just flip it open to the Old Testament. I'll tell you where we're going to be in just a second. Well, that's probably a good guess, all right? If you were to uh, take a trip to New York City, and if you were to go to the Garden of the United Nations, the Garden of the United Nations, uh, which is located along the East River at 46th Street and 1st Avenue, all right? So there, there you, can, you, can, you can find it, all right? The United Nations Garden, which is located in the United Nations headquarters, right? All right. You will find a statue there, a sculpture, and it's based off these words. He will settle disputes among many people and provide for strong nations that are far away. They will beat their swords into plows and their spears into pruning knives. Nation will not take up the sword against nation and they will never again train for war. Is anybody familiar with that scripture? Where is it? Does anybody know? How about chap, uh, check chapter 4? Okay. Okay. Check chapter 4. And I believe verse 3. All right. Does everybody see it? That statue, that sculpture was a gift of the Soviet, Soviet Union to the United Nations. And I think it was uh, made in, I think, 1959. All right? That's when the, the sculpture was built. But it's, it's based off Micah chapter 4, verse 3. Okay. Yeah, they're the ones who gave the, uh, the gift okay, to the United Nations. But, it's, but the key is, that's, that's, that verse seems to be implying what? What does the verse seem to be? Just focus on the verse before we focus on everything else. Well, first we have a he, right? He, whoever the he is, is going to do what? He's going to settle disputes among many peoples, right? And he's going to, what else ultimately is going to happen? They're going to beat their swords into plows and their spears into pruning knives. Nation will not what? Take up the sword against nation. They will never again train for war. That's a, that's a massive claim. That's a big claim that at some point, some individual is going to be involved in bringing about peace, global peace, world peace. Who is this individual? What, why is the scripture even there? What does it even mean? How do you even understand it? Go to Micah chapter 5. Go to Micah chapter 5. Yeah, now Micah chapter 5, we start in verse 1. Now gather thyself in troops. Now in Micah chapter 4, we have the, the seeming the end, a promise of the end of conflict, yes? Chapter 5, now gather thyself in troops, O daughter of troops. He hath laid siege against us. They shall smite the judge of Israel with a rod upon the cheek. But thou Bethlehem, Ephrata. Though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. Therefore will he give them up until the time that she which travaileth had brought forth. Then the remnant of the brethren shall return unto the children of Israel. And he shall stand and feed in the strength of the Lord and the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they shall abide for now shall he be great unto the ends of the earth. And this man shall be the peace when the Assyrian. Oh, now we're talking about the Assyrians again, which we've talked about before. Shall come into our land. And when he shall tread in our places, then shall we rise up against him seven shepherds and eight principal men. Now, when you read all of that, you're probably going, what in the world is going on? Yes, definitely in light of what we just read that's referenced in that sculpture in the Garden of the United Nations about an end of conflict. Chapter five speaks of conflict. So what is going on? Who's being spoken of? What? And, and everyone's familiar with that passage in Micah five, right? Verse two. But thou Bethlehem Ephrathah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel, 
whose goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. We know that passage, and why do we know that passage? Is it quoted in the New Testament? Is it referenced in the New Testament? If so, find it. Okay. Micah 5 2. Where is that? Is that referenced in the New Testament? Find where it's possibly referenced in the New Testament. See who can find it first. Matthew 2 6. What does Matthew 2 6 say? Oh, there we go. So it's, it's Matthew, Matthew chapter 2, verse what? 2, 6. And interesting enough, it says that uh, this person that's going to come forth from Bethlehem is going to do what? Rule, rule my people Israel. So we have, this, we have this promise. So we know clearly that this prophecy in my, uh, Micah 5 is, is related to Jesus in the New Testament. So, but when you read the rest of those scriptures around Micah 5, you're like, what is going on, right? There's a lot to figure out, a lot to try to understand. So, this week, for the Bible study exercise, it's all about Micah chapter 5. And because there, now we could just focus on verse 2. I mean, typically what most churches would do, we would look at Micah 5, 2, go, that's about Jesus. Then go over to Matthew 2, show how Jesus fulfilled it, and then move on as quickly as you can, because there's too many questions and problems in Micah 5 to try to figure out. But you know, we don't do that here, correct? We're going to figure out all the problems and all the difficulties. Now, because there's all kinds of problems and difficulties surrounding this verse and trying to understand what's going on, what is always the first key step in trying to figure out the problems with a passage? Book background study, right? You got to do a book background study, especially with the book of Micah. If I give you, if I give you a blank sheet of paper right now, write down everything you know about the book of Micah, what could you write down? Okay. We, we, we know that because of what we've read, you're like, oh, there's a promise about uh, peace and uh, that all the weapons of war can just be done away with. Okay. And we know that there's a prophecy of Jesus in chapter five. That's probably, but that wouldn't even be giving us any information about the background of the book. Correct. Okay. Oh, it's written by Micah. Okay. There we, we, we know some few things. So this morning, it's all about a book background study on the book of Micah. So if you have a Bible dictionary, have it nearby. All right, have a Bible dictionary ready to go. Um, And then I'm going to be utilizing a different source, and then I'll be referenced back to the Bible dictionaries at different times. Um, And do do you, is it, so if you have a Bible dictionary, that will be great. Um, And we'll work through this and see what information we can gather about the background of the book. And when you're studying the background of the book, what are you looking for? Uh, Anybody need a dictionary? Got one right here? Other than taking away my uh, microphone stand. Okay, all right. Okay. I got another one right here. Okay, yeah. Got another one? Yeah, see? Okay, there we go. All right. Yeah, if I can. And there's one sitting right up there, too. Right there in that pew right here. Yeah, they're, they're all over the place. Okay, so. Yeah, we, we've got, we got plenty of dictionaries, okay? And I got one, an extra one up here, so... All right, make sure you have a dic- dictionary. I know we have uh, the Nelsons. You're using Ungers. You're using Ungers, and then I'll be using a different source. So the reason we're going to be using multiple sources is... Okay, let's we'll just do a couple of a quick questions here, okay? And remember, Bible study exercise, I'll be using the basic rules I use for Bible study exercise, where I do a lot of presenting this for you to figure out. But just a couple of, of basic concepts whenever you do a background. Why, why are we doing a back? What, what's the purpose of a background study? Yeah, you got to know the who, what, where, when, how. You need, to, you need that background, that context, before you can start trying to interpret the individual parts. Does that make sense? So that's, we try to get all of that kind of information. That, that's one of the reasons. Um, and why do, we have, why do we check multiple sources when we do a background study? to ensure that there is some kind of agreement or consensus on the information because we don't want to take something and say, well, this is the way we should interpret this, and there's massive disagreements, right? 
So, for, for example, sometimes there can be major disagreements on the dating of a book. Well, that can have massive implications when you're trying to figure out how you're going to interpret it, right? Like, if you, if you date the book of Revelation pr- prior to uh, 70 AD, you could try to make some argument that it's a symbolic representation of what happened in 70 AD. If it's after that, then you can't do that, correct? Right? It would, it would, it would make... It would, well, it would greatly change the way you would interpret the book. Understanding the dating of the book of Hebrews greatly impacts the way we interpret the book of Hebrews. So we want as much agreement on all of the specifics to ensure that we have a correct understanding so that when we move into the actual book, we can try to figure these things out. So are you ready for some basic information? All right, here we go. I'm going to use a different source and then we'll go from here. All right. According to this source, Micah, the 8th century B.C. Israelite prophet from Judah, has given his name to this book as its composer. Uh, His name meaning, who is like the Lord in Hebrew. All right, so a couple of things. They say Micah is the uh, what century uh, prophet? 8th century Israelite prophet. And he's from where? Judah. His name is given to the book, and he is considered to be the author or composer of the book. And his name means what? Who is like the Lord, according to this source? We will verify and see if other sources agree or disagree. According to this source, the key text is Micah chapter 3, verse 8. They say that is the key text. Let's look at it. Micah chapter 3, verse 8. But truly I am full of power by the Spirit of the Lord and of judgment and of might to declare unto Jacob his transgression and to Israel his sin. Why do you think they would make that the key text or the key verse according to the source that I'm currently holding in my hand? Or to establish that it, this is a message of what? A message of judgment. That the book of Micah is a message of judgment. Now even though it's a message of judgment, looking at some of the verses we started off this morning with, there's also seeming to be what? Some promises, yes? Yes. Promises of, of getting ready all the weapons of war and turning it into time of peace and a promise of someone coming from Bethlehem who's ultimately going to do what? Uh, rule. rule who? Uh, over, Israel. over Israel. Okay, so that, that's, I think that's important to also note. But they want us to focus that this is a message of judgment. We'll see if everyone agrees with that. They believe, according to this uh, source, that the key term for the book is idolatry. And I want you to put your thinking caps on here and really understand this. They say, the essential sin of Judah, now stop right there. Now why is that significant? The essential sin of Judah Right, okay, that, that's seeming to indicate that he was a prophet sent to which? To Judah, to the southern kingdom, not to the northern kingdom of Israel. Now, we'll see if that holds true, but that seems to indicate that, right? We'll look at other sources and see if there's agreement or disagreement. And that their, their essential sin was the sin of idolatry, a rejection of the first table of the Ten Commandments. Now, what's the first table of the Ten Commandments? Look at Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20. Yeah, they break the the Ten Commandments are broken into two tables, right? And the first table is which commandments? We'll go to Exodus chapter 20 really quick. We, I could just summarize this, but I think it's a, a practical lesson here. Exodus chapter 20. Exodus 
All right, Exodus chapter 20. I am God, and God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them for I the Lord thy God am a jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless uh, that take his name in vain. Now, the first tablet focuses on sins directed against whom? God specifically, right? And so this would definitely include which sin? Idolatry, right? Clearly, you can't have any other gods before him. So the way this, this source states it this way. The essential, the essential sin, the essential sin of Judah was idolatry, a rejection of the first table of the Ten Commandments, the first four commandments. This brought about corruption, violence, and many other sins, a rejection of the second table, the last six commandments. So they're making an argument that all the other sins derive from which sin? The rejection of God, right? That the rejection of God is what leads to all the other corruption. The abandonment of God or the, uh, the placing a false God that uh, gives rise to all the others. That's, that's the argument that's being made. So they're going after that the key word, the key term is idolatry. And that is the key sin that is, well, the, that, the issue is here for Judah. Right? Any questions about that? Now, they're going to offer a one-sentence summary. All right, let's see how they summarize the book. Although Micah also prophesied against Israel, that's important to note. So Micah is going to prophesy against both Judah and Israel. His main message was against Judah, which must repent of idolatry and injustice or, go, or also go into exile. But then he... Rest, then, but then be restored to divine blessing under the ruler from Bethlehem. All right, so, very important. So the main focus is against whom? Judah. Judah needs to repent of what? Idolatry. idolatry. If they don't re repent of their idolatry, they're going to go where? Into exile, right? But they will be restored under whom? They're going to be rest restored to divine blessings under the ruler from Bethlehem. Now that, there's a lot of, there's a lot, now this is eschatology jumps in all over the place here, right? Okay, so wait a minute, we're right back to this, this, the, the subject we talk about over and over and over again in some of these passages. You can't read the Old Testament without having these issues. They went into exile, did they not? How long? They came out of Babylonian captivity, right? Was... Were they ruled over by the one who came from Bethlehem at that point in time? No. They come out of Babylonian captivity only to go back under whose control? They go back or they go under the control of Rome. They're under the control of Rome when the one from Bethlehem arrives. Arrives. Yes, he arrives and then it begins to arise to some level of prominence. Does he restore them to some sense of blessing and freedom from their, capt capt their captors? No, they do not. Right? In fact, what happens to them? Yeah, they end up being destroyed in 70 AD. Right? And then they stay basically dispersed and not a nation until 1948. I think it's 48. 1948. And then did the one from Bethlehem come over and rule over them? And no. Has, is he ruling over them now? No. So then you either have to say what? What's your options? Hasn't happened yet, but it will. Or, it's not talking about Israel, it's talking about the church, which is what Matthew, Henry, and others will do. Now, the only problem with that is what? The exile was literal, but the, but the blessing is somehow spiritual. And again, I can't stand... So, 
the, the idolatry was, everything was literal until uh, then, all, but then we've got to find a way to get this because we want to rip the promise from whom? Israel and give it to who? Us. Isn't that, isn't that a, isn't it convenient how that always works? Right. And I love, I love the fact when people, usually the people making those arguments tend to be Gentiles sitting in a Gentile church. They don't want to go over to Israel and say, hey, all of you, you don't get, you don't get anything. But what, what the Bible says, you don't know how to read it. Okay. Because I'm a Gentile and I figured it all out with my, you know, two days of Bible study. Okay, right? that, that, like, I mean, it's, it's, it's just kind of arrogant to do that, right? I just think it's arrogant. All right, so God's message in the book. Here we go. Purpose. This is what they say the purpose is. The book preserves the divinely inspired prophecies that Micah made during his ministry of at least 20 years. These prophecies were originally for the people of Judah facing Assyrian invasions. Now, why is that important? If the prophecies were originally for someone facing real danger, if the fulfillment of that prophecy isn't for them or for Israel or for Judah, and it's somehow for the church, then you can't say that the original message was for them. Yeah, that, that, that would have been like, hey, guys, this, these promises, this is for this thing called the church, and it's going to be made up of Gentiles. <laughs> they, they, no, they would not have understood that in any way, shape, or form, all right? But, so, these prophecies were originally for the people of Judah facing, and who were they facing an uh, invasion from? Assyria. Assyria. Does that, isn't it interesting how many of these prophecies are connected with the Assyrians and and all of those kinds of situations going all the way back to Isaiah 7. Micah warned that because of idolatry and injustice, God's case against Judah and Israel was severe. Their kingdoms would be destroyed, even though individuals could still repent and seek the Lord like Isaiah, uh, his colleague. Micah looked beyond the Assyrian captivity of Israel and the Babylonian captivity of Judah to the time when they would be forgiven and restored in righteousness, living under the Davidic ruler that God would send. So what were they looking forward to? Here are the things that Micah and all the prophets were looking forward to. That Judah and Israel would be what? Forgiven, restored in righteousness, and living under a Davidic ruler that God would send. That's what they were looking forward to. What were the three things they were looking forward to? Forgiveness, restoration, and leadership are living under the Davidic ruler. Now, did they ever experience any of that? Not in any meaningful way. The best you can, the best you can hope for is when they came out of Babylonian captivity. You can go, well, a little bit of it was there. Exactly. Well, now that's super, why is that important? Well, I think it's important because when you look at these prophecies and they are applied to Jesus, that demonstrates that clearly no, there had been no fulfillment of said prophecy prior to, so you cannot look to the return of the Babylonian captivity as some kind of fulfillment. Well, then you look to, okay, this applies to Jesus. Then you have to ask, did Jesus forgive Israel? Did he restore Israel? Did he rule over Israel? No. No. And then you have to ask, well, then why would Paul say in Romans 11 that all Israel will be what? Saved. Well, that means then Jesus didn't do it. Paul's looking for a future. So then you're of wit. So you see how from, an, from a point of eschatology, you have to start going, wait a minute. How do we understand this? All right. They go on to say this. Micah deals with the worldview categories of rebellion and sin, covenant and redemption, time and eternity. Judah's sins was about to have catastrophic consequences, yet exile was not the final word. Micah offered a broad understanding of redemption from his own day until the time that their king would pass through before them the Lord as their leader. Look at Micah 2, I believe, verse 13. See if you find something similar to that. Thirteen. What do we find there? <coughs> All right. The, 
Okay, so it speaks of a leader leading them, guiding them, right? Some kind of promise of that. And then you have to go, well, when did that occur, right? Uh, God's wrath against idolatry and all forms of human sin, against others, others, violence, corruption, exploitation, is manifest in the book. The Assyrian and Babylonian captivities were the result of God's justice, yet he also a merciful God who does not retain anger forever. He will ultimately cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. I'm, I'm going to look and see, I believe. Look at Micah, I believe chapter 7. Look, I think verse 19 maybe. Yes. Okay, uh, Micah seven nineteen. Everybody there? He will turn again. He will have compassion upon us. Now, who would that us be? Judah, right? He will subdue our iniquities and that will cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. That's a promise of what? Some kind of salvation to whom? Judah, Israel. Like that, these are the kinds of, these are the things that show up in the Bible over and over and over and over again. I, I, I've got to stress this. Anytime, this, it, it's so frustrating, but it's so important to realize. If you just take your Bible and just start reading the major prophets and the minor prophets, right? The major prophets and the minor prophets. And you look at every promise that clearly has some connection to Israel or Judah. Just, you just write down every promise, right? And at some point, you're going to have to go, wait a minute. A good portion of these never been fulfilled in any meaningful way. There's just no way you can find any fulfillment for them. So then you either have to then rip them out of their context and apply them to the church, or you have to look for a future one. That's what all eschatology comes down to. Right? I, I hate that eschatology gets reduced to, you know, there's some strange guy standing on a street corner with holding a sign saying the end is near, right? It gets reduced to crazy people making predictions that, you know, Jesus is coming back tomorrow. Or it gets reduced to some poorly made movie uh, about biblical prophecy. I hate that everything gets reduced to that. That's not what it's about. It's about reading your Bible going, wait a minute, that's a promise. That's a promise that he's going to get rid of their sins. When did he get rid of it? And if he got rid of it, then why is Paul saying that all Israel will be saved? If he already got rid of it, then haven't they already been saved, right? So you got to figure these things. It always comes down to these things. Any, any argument, before anyone makes an argument, don't argue. Go read the major prophets. Go read the minor prophets and just write down all the promises and then show me when they were fulfilled. Now, one, nobody who argues ever wants to do the work. Two, when you do that, you're going to realize, wait a minute. And it, trust me, if it was so easy to say, well, it was already fulfilled, then why did all of the church fathers, in many cases, the early church fathers, why did they start looking for a fulfillment in the church? Why do you think the early church started looking for a fulfillment in the church? It didn't exist. Can you imagine reading your Bible going, wait a minute, there's all these promises to Israel and Israel doesn't exist. What do you, what do you do? Now, what, what lesson should we learn from that? What's, what's an important lesson about hermeneutics in regards to what the early church did about this problem? Don't let circumstances change how you interpret the scripture. What, what, how do you interpret the scripture? Based on what the scriptures say, not what is happening in society or culture. That we should have learned that lesson. The fact that the early church was like, man, what, what do we do? There's no Israel. Okay, we've got a solution. We're Israel. And, and, that, and, and that just a, and he, hey, there is no Israel. Oh, wait, we're Israel. That's not how you do hermeneutics. You do hermeneutics by going, wait a minute, when they talk about Israel, what are they talking about? And what we've, we spent, what, six months proving it. They're talking about the nation. Well, if they're talking about the nation and the nation doesn't exist, what conclusion should you come to? The nation has to come back together and these promises have to be fulfilled. Right? And so it's amazing that some of the early people who are kind of seen as the forefathers of dispensationalism, it's kind of interesting that they started saying, no, the nation has to come back. This has to be literally fulfilled before the nation existed. 
That's absolutely amazing that they, they stood against everyone else and said, no, you're wrong. You're wrong. And then when the nation came back, they probably there was a little bit of going. We tried to tell you. We tried to tell you. Now, just because the nation has come back, has all of this been fulfilled yet? No. Does it? And, and let's, all, all, let's be honest. From a human perspective, does it look like it will ever be fulfilled? No, it, it does. From a human perspective, it doesn't. Yeah, but I'm saying from just looking at the human perspective, you've been to Israel. Okay. Doesn't look like this, does it? And they were launching missiles just, uh, what, yesterday into Gaza. They, they launched missiles into Gaza because Gaza had launched rocket attacks. So, I mean, there's always problems. There's always issues. All right, so I just think it's, it's interesting of those kinds of problems. Christ's birth in Bethlehem is specifically pro- uh, prophesied in Micah chapter 5, verse 2. And the Spirit of God was present to empower uh, the prophet. Micah painted a dark picture of humanity as all too prone to wickedness, People from small to great were laying awake at night planning evil. The only hope was divine interference with which will happen when God personally takes responsibility for shepherding his flock. Look at Micah 2.12. What do we have in Micah 2.12? What do we have in 2.12? He's going to bring them all together and be basically their shepherd. Well, when did he bring all of Israel together to be their shepherd? Again, these are all kinds of issues. Then, now this is very important. And we may, this is something I want you to hear carefully. In Micah, salvation is mainly corporate. Why do you think that is? The nation, yes. Now that what, that's throughout the over and over and over. What, a lot of times it talks about the salvation of Israel, the salvation, and you're like, well, wait a minute that that has massive that has massive implications, does it not? So again, how would Matthew Henry handle that? The that's the church. That's the church. That's the church. Because that's your only option. That's your only option. You only really have two options: it's Israel or it's not Israel. Right? It is based on God's forgiveness of sins and restoring his people under the coming king. Please note, salvation involves two things in Micah and in many of the uh, minor prophets and, and major prophets. God's forgiveness of sins and restoring his people under the coming king. So you can't just say, well, well, Jesus died for their sins. That's not a sufficient answer for their, their, the understanding of salvation in their context. What two things are required? Forgiveness and what? Restoration under the coming king. To be restored under that coming king, to be him to be ruling over them. They go on to say, however, in the book, you can see some individual dimension of salvation. Those in a right relationship with God in this lifetime show it in the way they live now, reflected in perhaps the most beloved text from the book, and they say the most beloved text of the book is Micah chapter 6, verse 8. And does everybody know that verse? Yes. It's this idea that what is God requires us to act justly, to love faithfulness, and to walk humbly with your God. There's the individual aspect. There's the individual aspect. God may save them corporately, but individually, what are they to do as individuals? Love justice, right? Walk humbly with their God. Right. Get the idea? Okay, love mercy. All right, those concepts. Okay, now, Micah re- repeats Israel's messianic pr- uh, promise. Century, uh, uh, Micah repeats Israel's messianic promise centering in the exaltation of God's temple as the worship place for all nations and the end of war. All right? Go, go to Micah chapter 4. I want you to see th- these things. In fact, we may just look at this one, Micah 4. That whole chapter. 
We almost have to study Micah 4 before we can do 5, but we, we don't have the ability to do that this week. But here we go. Micah chapter 4, look at verse 1. But in the last days it shall come to pass that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established in the top of the mountains, and it shall be exalted above the hills, and people shall flow unto it. What is that re- referencing? The establishment of what? The temple. That's the temple. Why, what is it called in Micah 5, uh, 4, one? The mountain of the Lord. The Lord's temple. There you go. The temple. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. He's promising that the temple's going to be restored and everyone's going to flow into it. What happened to the temple in 70 AD? What is it today? It's a mosque. Yeah, yeah, it's a mosque. Okay. People are not flowing to the temple, are they? Yeah, and in many cases, the Jews can't even access the, the very... Isn't that crazy? The Jews can't even access it. Meaning, who is controlling the area? Gentiles. And remember the whole idea in, in uh, Romans 11 is that Israel is set aside until the time of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Well, there, there's, there's the case. Now, again, you look at the... Now, I can, Look, I make no condemnation of the church fathers because when you go read some of their writing, I understand. They're like, wait, th- there's no temple. There's no nothing, right? So there's not even an Israel. So how are they going to restore a temple? I mean, they're not even a nation. I mean, like, it, it, it would seem ab- absurd to read these prophecies in that period of time in the early church. Now, once 1948 happened, that's why, why there was a dramatic shift and eschatology. There was a dramatic shift because the people are like, oh, oh, okay. Well, then, 1948, where are we now? 2022. So guess what? After years and years, 1958, mm, still not happened. 1968, still not happened. 1978, okay, it's getting ready. It's got to be close. 1988, remember there was like 88 reasons that Christ is going to return in 1988. There was all these books. 1990s, then you had Harold Camping, uh, Family Radio. I, I went to that school. All of a sudden, he lost his absolutely mind, telling us that everything was going to happen in 1994. It didn't happen. Then in 2000, he, he changed the prediction to the 2000s. And he started off as an amillennialist, right? And so everyone started losing their minds. And then people are like, forget it. And so then you saw a rise, a lot of the rejection of all of that. Then you saw the rise of amillennialism or preterism, Right? The preterist movement really jumped, it became really, uh, I won't say powerful, but be- became more influential. And everybody knows the preterist movement. Basically, everything happened in 70 AD. Everything. So all the prophecies basically were fulfilled in 70 AD. And then some would go so far to even claim Jesus came back in 70 AD in a spiritual way. And so there's not, we're not even looking for Jesus to come back. Right? So preterism is, is a... And, and you can see why, because you, after a while you're like, well, nothing ever happened. But what again, what are they basing their hermeneutic on? Circumstances. This is a common thing within the church is you're like, well, look, nah, I don't, I don't want to be up. And I can understand you see some of the craziness and some of the, this and you're like, I don't want to be associated with that. But you can't let what people do with the teaching determine, determine if you're going to hold on to it or not hold on to it. Your, your te- the teaching you hold on to is that what you find in Scripture, not what people do with it. People can abuse anything. People can take something true and abuse it. That doesn't make something not true. That just means what should you condemn? Not the truth, but the abuse of the truth. And there's been a lot of craziness when it comes to biblical prophecy. But these promises are, are all over the place. What else happens in Micah chapter 4? We've got verse 1, right? Everybody's going to flow to it. What happens in verse 2? And many nations shall come up and say, come, let us go to the mountain of the Lord and to the house of the God of Jacob. And he will teach us his ways and he will and we will walk in his paths for the law shall go forth out of Zion Zion, and the Lord, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Now, when you read those kinds of verses, what does that seeming to imply? That nations are going to exist. This is not talking about heaven. Right. Nations are going to exist and they're all going to go where? To the temple to hear what? The word of God. That has never happened. (laughs) That has never happened. 
So guess what? How, guess what Matthew Henry will try to do? I, I don't have the Matthew Henry commentary, but I can speculate. That's the church. That's the church. Everyone coming to was well, the whole world coming to the church? Well, they see, see people from all nations are, are coming into the church. It's just it, be, it just it, that has nothing to do with what's being promised here. What what goes on in verse three? And he shall judge among many people and rebuke strong nations afar off, and they shall beat their swords into plow. Now, I, I want to make it very clear. How does that happen in the church? Here's what blows my mind, right? Many in the church, and many Christians will say, or many Christians will say, see, that's spiritual. See, when we come into the church, we get rid of all of our weapons of war and we're all at peace. Well, first of all, that's garbage. I mean, Christians have been fight. I mean, even in some parts of church history, kill one another, right? I mean, look at the craziness that would happen in different parts of the country where you have Protestants and Catholics killing one another. So, so that, that, there's no way you can say this is fulfilled in the church, even from that case. But isn't it embarrassing that the church can't figure it out, <laughs> but the Soviet Union has a sculpture made and gives a gift to the United Nations who seems to understand the verse in what kind of a way? A literal way. <laughs> An atheistic country has a better understanding of Scripture than some Christians. That's embarrassing. And that goes back to what I've said so many times. That the uh, understanding of Scripture is not some super... Like, God gives you the Spirit. Now you can understand it. I've known atheists understand the Bible far better than many Christians. And that's an embarrassment. Because we don't get some super spiritual secret decoder ring. No, you understand scripture through what? Everyday ways of interpreting what? Any type of written literature. And I, it's embarrassing when Christians cannot figure that out. When I hear Christians start saying things about a text of scripture, and sometimes I'm just like, just stop, just stop talking, okay? Because emba- you're embarrassing yourself. The Soviet Union, like, hey, here's this verse, and it's, it speaks of a time of of great peace. I'm going to send it to the United Nations, which is supposedly designed to try to bring what? Peace. It's, now, I'm not saying they, they understand the spiritual implications, but, they, but, but Christians, there's many Christians like, no, 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 no. That's the church. And you're like, what are you talking about? It makes, it makes no sense. Agreed? Okay, even if you don't agree, you, I'm telling you, it makes no sense if, if we understand it that way. All right, what happens in verse 4? But they shall sit every man under his vine and under his fig tree, and none shall make them afraid, for the mouth of the Lord of the host hath spoken it. What's the concept there? They can just sit down and do what? Just sit down and relax. They don't have to worry about anything. Everything's, all, all the conflicts are gone. Has the world ever experienced that? No. Has Israel ever experienced that? Clearly not. I mean, Israel's constantly under threat. Constantly. I mean, there's still all the discussion about, okay, if Iran it gets a nuclear weapon, what will Israel do? Do they launch a preemptive strike? And if they do, then there's all, I mean, there's every year there's concerns about that because every year Iran gets closer and closer and what will Israel do? Will they wait for America? What, and all kinds of discuss, discussions there, all right? So th- those are just some of the prophecies right there in Micah 4, which just, you have to consider that before you form your, eschatology in any major way. Does that make sense? All right. Now I'm going to give you some dates here. I, I thought we were going to look at multiple sources, but we're obviously not, not going to. Okay. All right. Here we go. Um, when the events of, the book hap- of this book happened, so they want to give us some dates. Micah prophesied during the reigns of three kings of Judah. Jotham, Ahaz and Hezekiah. So this would put his prophecy somewhere between 740 BC and 700 BC. Well, especially in and and so as, as some of these cases, yes, they, it was. Now, what's significant about that? This puts him somewhere close to the time of whose prophecy? Isaiah, because with Isaiah dealing with Ahaz, 
All right, so remember, he, he's called a colleague of Isaiah right, at times. All right, uh, 2 Kings 15, 32 to chapter 20, verse 21. And 2 Chronicles 27 to 32 provide the historical narrative for the three kings mentioned. Look at Micah chapter 1, I believe, verse 1. I think it mentions all three kings in chapter 1, verse 1. I could be wrong. Okay, all three are mentioned. Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. All right. So if you want the historical narrative for that period of time, what, where do you read? 2 Kings 15, 32 to 2 Kings chapter 20, verse 21. And Second Chronicles twenty-seven to thirty-two. If I gave you wrong numbers uh, the first time, I apologize. Yeah, chronological Bible. I think there's one sitting. I think, there, I think there's one right there. I think there's chronological Bible right there. Yeah, chronological Bibles are big helps here when you're reading some of these things because you're reading it and you're like, oh, and all of a sudden they'll bring in the historical narrative and then you get some kind of a con- concept. So yeah, uh, chronological Bible can be very helpful. All right. Um, in the city of Samaria, idolatrous, idolatrous kings uh, ruled the northern kingdom of Israel. The power of Aram, which is Syria, with its capital in Damascus, was a constant threat. Now, please note, this, what, does this not sound a lot like Isaiah 7, 8, and 9? All right, we got the Syrians, yes. All right. Um, then there, then there, there, there was the Assyrians with their capital in Nineveh, and Judah was isolated with many powerful enemies. Remember, that was the whole problem. Judah was constantly isolated and constantly in fear. And remember, then Ahaz didn't want to listen to God. He wanted to try to come up with solutions, and we talked about all of that uh, before. During the rule of King Ahaz, which they have as 735 to 715 B.C., you see that puts that right here during the time Micah prophesied. Right, 735 to 715 BC. The Assyrians conquered Samaria, fill, fulfilling Micah's words. Ahaz's son, Hezekiah, who reigned from 715 to 668 BC, paid attention to the prophets Isaiah and Micah and instituted religious reform. All right, now let's see. Oh, there's so much more here I want to go into. How much time do I have? I'll get maybe like five minutes. All right, here we go. The events of Micah's time belong to chapter two of the story. God educates his nation, disobedient Israel, uh, disciplined. Judah was weak and impotent. It had become a little like the surrounding, it had become like the surrounding nations. They were idolatrous and corrupt to the core. There was, there was little sense that it was part of God's kingdom of righteousness and holiness. They were a disobedient and sinful people who would be judged, yet Micah prophesied the coming of a ruler, a descendant of David, to be born in Bethlehem, who would one day rule the kingdom in righteousness. All right, I'm going to try to do this. Okay, uh, the author and date of the writing, the author and date of the writing. All right, who's the author? Micah, and they have the date of the writing, perhaps, and they, I love when they say perhaps, they have 700 B.C. They have 700 B.C. Now you can look at uh, the dictionaries next to you and see, do they agree, disagree, do they put a different date? What do they say? Okay. Do they have a, a specific date mentioned for the writing? Sometime during this period. Okay. <laughs> All right. What does Unger say? Does it know? So we're going to put somewhere around 700 BC if you want if you want to put down a possible time. Okay, all right, does that make sense? 
Micah was contemporary to what two prophets? Micah was contemporary to what two prophets? We know Isaiah. Hosea. Who said Hosea? Okay, because you're reading it or because you knew it? Okay, all right. I was going to say, whoa, that's awesome. Okay, all right. All right. I was like, woohoo, someone knew something. All right, all right. All right. He was from the small town. Anybody know where he's from? Morseth. There, that's correct. All right. Um, very good. Sometimes it's called Morseth Dash Gath. That sometimes is how it's listed out. All right. Uh, which is in southern Judah. Almost nothing is known of his personal life. He saw the fulfillment of his predictions about the fall of Samaria to the Assyrians. Micah also witnessed the great religious revival initiated by Hezekiah, which delayed, uh, which delayed by a century the fulfillment of his, of his prophecies about the coming fall of Jerusalem. He was one of the few prophets whose warnings of judgment were heeded. He probably wrote down his prophecies during the last years of Hezekiah. That's when they think possibly he wrote it down, the last years of Hezekiah. That's why he wrote these down. All right, the, uh, the first audience for the book, the people of Judah living during Micah's lifetime. The first hearers were probably living in Judah near the end of the 700s BC. That's who the words were for. I cannot stress that enough. You can't, I just, I can't stand when people just rip these verses out of their context and say, hey, they're, they're, they're about us. Well, no, in many cases, they have nothing to do with us, all right? The specific occasion for Micah's prophecies is not known. They do, however, fit the period of religious and social corruption present during the rule of Ahaz. Um, and Hezekiah, uh, rip, uh, let's see, uh, now I'll just go through a couple of things here. According to Jeremiah 26, Hezekiah repented in response to hearing Micah 3.12, a prophecy of the coming fall of Jerusalem. Look at Micah 3.12. What does Micah 3.12 say? Therefore shall Zion, for your sake, be plowed as a field, and Jerusalem shall become heaps, and the mountains of the house as the high places of the people. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's not good news. Hey, uh, someone's at the door. Who is it? It's Micah. What has he got to tell you? He's got to tell you that Jerusalem is going to be plowed down, and everything's going to be destroyed. Oh, that's not good. Okay, so what, what can we do? Hezekiah. Hezekiah repented in response to hearing Micah 3.12, a prophecy of the coming fall of Jerusalem. They say that that's based off Jeremiah 26.18. Let's look at it really quick. Jeremiah 26.18. We can see if that is proven to be true or false. Jeremiah 26.18. I'm going to have to stop here. Try to finish this section. 26.18 according to this book. Does that make sense or no? Uh, there you go. He's quoting Micah 3. Jeremiah is quoting Micah. Uh-huh. Yep. And he says that it was given to Hezekiah. And the days of Hezekiah. There you have it. And so from what we can know historically, that he repented of that because of that prophecy. Did not Hezekiah fear the Lord? Okay. All right. Everybody see that? So you may want to write down uh, Jeremiah twenty six eighteen right there in your in the notes and 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 Micah three. Now again, why is this all important? Because these are again I cannot stress this enough. What kind of prophecies are these? Prophecies of literal events, of literal danger, of literal warnings. Now Hezekiah. Now I want to make sure you understand this. Hezekiah's repentance in a sense, may delay, delayed it, but ultimately, guess what happened? Jerusalem still falls, okay, because when, when the prophecy is made, it's, it's, it's made, okay. Uh, the religious revival Hezekiah instituted marked a genuine return to worship of the Lord. Later on, Isaiah worked with Hezekiah when the Assyrian army under uh, basically laid siege against Jerusalem in 701 B.C., uh, I think that was Sennacherib who did that. And God miraculously spared the city. Micah did not tell what prompted the collection of his writings. Obviously, he doesn't say what prompted it, but we would assume that God prompted the, 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 the idea. 
All right? Now, literary features. Okay. Uh, I want to kind of give an outline. I'm just going to stop there. We'll just have to stop there. And I'll have to pick this up in podcast uh, form. Uh, I don't like doing that, but I'll have to finish it that way. Because we're going to run out of time. Okay? All right. Any questions about any of that? Okay. So the background, so if we were to summarize, what's kind of the background of the book? It's a book filled with warnings about what? Judgment in regards to basically what sin? Idolatry. In the midst of the promise of judgment, what else is there a promise of? Salvation, restoration, and a divine ruler. That divine ruler is identified where? Matthew chapter 2 as being whom? Christ. Right? And so then that means some of these promises have never been fulfilled literally. It would even hard even be hard to try to say they were fulfilled spiritually. All right? So that means when we go to Micah 5 and we read all those verses surrounding verse 2, we have to then understand that this is being placed in a context where you have these real nations, real danger, real problems, and then we'll have to figure out how the prof- prophecy fits in with some of that. Okay? Any other questions? Any? Good? All right, we'll stop right there. Lord God, we come before you. We thank you for having the opportunity to try to understand some of these prophecies, trying to understand how they relate to the prophecy of your son. We pray that we just, as we spend this week thinking about this passage and and looking at it and and understanding it, that we'll grow in our understanding of it and that we'll apply it in the ways that are acceptable and are correct to our lives. And we ask this in Jesus' name. And God's people said...